In this part of the lower limb, we are going to describe the thigh. In this part, this will be the first part of the thigh where we are going to describe the layers of the thigh, the front of the thigh, the femoral triangle, the femoral sheath. That's a section, cross section in the thigh, showing the layers starting from the skin, superficial fascia, deep fascia, and then the muscles and the nerves deep to the deep fascia. We are going to start by the superficial fascia. The superficial fascia of the thigh is divided into two layers a superficial fatty layer and deep membranous layer. The arrangement of these two layers are a superficial fatty, as we said, which is, contains a good amount of fat and is continuous up with that of the anterior nerve wall and below with that of the leg and the foot. That layer of fat contains the cutaneous vessels and nerves supplying the skin. The second layer is what we call it the deep membranous layer or, or the fascia of scarves. And that fascia starts at the level of the umbilicus where the, the superficial fascia at that level will divide into two layers, the fatty layers and a new one which is the deep membranous layer. That deep membranous layer will descend downwards and pass to the thigh on the right and the left for almost about half, about one inch below and back to the inguinal ligament where it ends by fusing with the fascia later. Between the two thighs, that fascia will continue to invest in the genital organs and then descend to backward to the perineum where it will share in the formation of the perineal pouches. These are the two layers of the superficial fascia of the thigh. The number of cutaneous nerves on the front of the thigh comes from three sources, from the lumbar plexus directly, or as branches of the femoral nerve, or branches of the obturator nerve. That is the three sources. From the lumbar plexus, the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh, which is a branch from the lumbar plexus from the second and third roots of the lumbar plexus, the ilium which is a branch from the first lumbar roots, and the femoral branch of the genitofemoral nerve, and it's a branch from the lumbar plexus again from the first and second lumbar segments. The femoral nerve, which is a branch from the, the lumbar plex from the second and third and fourth, as we will know from the lumbar plexus, it will give intermediate cutaneous nerve of the thigh and the median cutaneous nerve of the thigh. Lastly, the obturator will give a small branch on the medial side of the thigh, which supplies the skin of that area. So we have a lateral cutaneous of the thigh a lateral, intermediate, and medial cutaneous nerve of the thigh. These are the cutaneous nerves supplying the front of the thigh. For the cutaneous vessels, there is some arteries and some veins within the superficial fascia of the front of the thigh. The arteries are the superficial branches of the femoral artery, and there are three branches. The superficial extermodendal, which is directed medially to the external genitalia. Superficial epigastric artery, which will go upwards and medially toward the umbilical region in the anterior nerve wall. 
and the superficial circumflex iliac, which will go laterally toward the anterior superior leg spine, supply the skin of the front of the thigh, the anterior abdominal wall, and part of the dorsal aspect of the trunk. These arteries will share in anastomosis with other arteries around the anterior superior leg spine, in the genital organs, and around the umbilicus this superficial branches of the femoral artery. The veins are those veins accompanying the superficial arteries which we have mentioned here, but the main one is the great saphenous vein, that is the largest vein found on the front of the thigh, that is the one over here, and it is the one who receives the three superficial veins accompanying the three superficial arteries of the femoral artery. The veins end in the great saphenous vein. As we said, this great saphenous vein is an important vein, and very large vein starting from the dorsum of the foot up in the leg to the thigh where it will end in the femoral vein. Its start is important to know and its relation to the medial malleolus, which we are going to mention now, is important and this vein is used for intravenous injection of fluids in emergency cases like in burns and other conditions and is one of the important tools of intravenous injections, especially for fluids. It begins, as we said, at the middle end of the dorsal venous arch, which is formed from the common digital veins, which drain the digital veins of the toes. This arch has two ends, a lateral end and medial end. The lateral end will form the small saphenous vein or the short saphenous vein while the middle end will form the great saphenous vein or the long saphenous vein. That one ascends, as I said, important point in front of the medial malleolus accompanied by the saphenous nerve. Then it will ascend on the medial surface of the tibia directly under the skin and all the surface of the medial surface of, of that part of the tibia is subcutaneous. It has no deep fascia. It goes obliquely and ascends along the medial surface of the posterior part of the medial side of the knee and then in the side it deviates or starts to be an anterior structure in the front of the side. Finally it took around what we'll call it the falciform margin here. We'll describe that saphenous opening with that very sharp border which is a good support for the angle made by this great saphenous vein to join the femoral vein. Along its course, it has important communication with what we call it the perforating veins. And along that course of that vein, there is a good number of valves. That vein, as I said, important for that injection and with the communication of the perforating veins, it is a target for some diseases like the varicosity, varicose veins along its course in the lower limb is important in that point. <clears throat> The compartments of the thigh. The thigh is divided by three septa extending from the fascia later, the deep fascia of the thigh, to the linea aspera on the back of the femur, the medial, the lateral, and the posterior septa, dividing it into anterior, medial, and posterior compartments. The anterior compartment, which we call it the extensor compartment, is supplied by the femoral nerve. 
this compartment. The posterior compartment, which we call it the flexor compartment, is supplied by the sciatic nerve. While the medial compartment muscles are supplied by the obturator nerve. These are the three compartments of the sci with their nerve supply and their functions. The deep fascia in the whole body is described as being a tough layer, plastic, non-elastic, non-stretchable membrane. And that membrane is the one giving the shape and keeping the shape of the related part of the body. Here in the thigh, it is tough as the usual and is named the fascia lata. Its attachment, it looks like a cone with a large circle above surrounding the edges of the thigh and a small circle below surrounding the leg. So superiorly is attached anteriorly to the inguinal ligament, pulling that ligament downwards so it looks concave upwards toward the, toward the abdomen. Medially it will be attached to the body of the pubis, then the side of the pubic arch, then the ramus and the tuberosity of the ischium to reach posteriorly to the posterior border of the sacrotuberous membrane, sacrotuberous ligament. Posteriorly it will continue to be on the back of the sacrum and the back of the sacrotuberous ligament. Laterally it is more strong and called the fascia, the iliotibial tract and it splits to surround the fascia lata muscle and get attached to the tuberosity of the iliac crust and the outer or the ventral part of the iliac crust. This is the attachment of the fascia lata. Inferiorly on each side is attached to the two condyles of the tibia and the head of the fibula, while anteriorly is attached to the patella, to the sides of the patella. Posteriorly it is thickened and form the roof of the mobletean fossa. One of the features of the upper part of the deep fascia is the presence of the saphenous opening, which is an opening in that fascia. That opening lies half an inch below the inguinal ligament, half an inch below the, that is the inguinal ligament, is almost half an inch below the inguinal ligament. Its center is one and a half inches below and lateral to the pubic tubercle. And this location is important to remember because that saphenous opening could be and passage for the femoral hernia. So we have to know the exact position. The saphenous opening is closed by a thin fascia, we call it the cribriform fascia, being fenestrated for the passage of the great saphenous vein and other vessels like the superficial branches of the femoral artery and a good number of lymph vessels which connect the superficial inguinal lymph nodes with the deep inguinal lymph nodes. Its upper, lateral and lower margin is thickened to form what we call it the falciform margin, while the medial margin is very thin and ill-defined and very weak. 
We have to remember that when we are describing the descent of the femoral hernia. That falciform margin supports the arching of the great saphenous vein to leave the superficial fascia through the opening to join the femoral vein. The thickened part of the fascia lata on the lateral side is what we call it the iliotibial tract. And this is the thickened part on the lateral side. In a living person, which is a muscular person, you can see a lat on the lateral side a groove on the lateral side of the side. And this is the iliotibial tract, which is very strong and very tense, with the bulging of the muscles on each side which is the vastus lateralis muscle. That's how it appears in a living person. It receives the insertion of the tensor fascia lata and the superficial three quarters of the gluteus maximus. So that tract of that fascia could be considered the abnerosis of these two muscles and that was very thick and strong. At the lower end is attached to the lateral condyle of the tibia, the head of the fibula, and the capsule of the knee joint. Those muscles attached or inserted into the, the iliotibial tract will now pull the tibia against the femur and pull the femur against the hip bone of the pelvis, transforming the lower limb during standing into a rigid column. So it helps in the preserving the standing of the person or supporting this, the limbs during standing. That is the function of the iliotibial tract. After removal of the deep fascia, the muscles on the front of the thigh will be exposed. That muscle here, which we call it the sartorius muscle, extending from the anterior superior iliac spine on the lateral side to cross the thigh from lateral to medial and to gain insertion into the medial part, medial surface of the tibia in the upper part of that surface. As it divides the front of the thigh into two parts, bars lateral to it and bars medial to it. The bars lateral to it is only the quadriceps muscle with the fascia lata and the tensor fascia lata on the lateral side of that muscle. A removal of the quadriceps will show directly the bones of the femur, the anterior aspect of the bones, the femur. While on the medial side, there is the layers which are the first layer from lateral to medial will be the iliacus, the psoas, the bictinus, and the abductor longus. Removal of the iliacus and psoas will exposure the hip, hip joint directly, while deep to the pectineus will be the obturator externus, and deep to the obturator externus will be the hip bone, the obturator foramen of the hip bone. Removal of the ductal longus will expose the brevis, removal of the ductal brevis will expose the ductal magnus. These are the three adductor muscles in the layers. On the medial side of these three layers will be the gracilis muscle. That is the arrangement of the muscles of the front of the thigh and their layers. The femoral triangle is the space in front of the upper third of the thigh. The thigh is divided into three thirds. An upper third which have the or contain 
the femoral triangle. A middle third where the ductal canal will be lying. A lower third on the back where the upper half of the popliteal fossa will be there. These are the three parts of the thigh. The boundaries of that triangle are above the inguinal ligament, which will form the base of that triangle. Laterally will be the medial border of the sartorius muscle. And medially again the medial border of the adductor longus. The roof will be formed by the skin, superficial and deep fascia, the fascia that of the side. While the apex will be formed by the meeting of the two muscles. The floor is formed by those muscles from lateral to medial, the iliacus, the psoas, the pectineus, and the psoas major. That's from lateral to medial. But from medial to lateral will be the abductor longus, the pectineus, the psoas, and lastly the iliacus. These are the boundaries of the femoral triangle. That is a cadaveric specimen showing the femoral triangle with the lateral border here, the lateral border of the sartorius, the medial border of the adductor longus, the apex is the mating of these two muscles overlap of the sartorius on the adductor longus, the base is the inguinal ligament, and these are part of the contents which you are going to talk about it. That is the femoral nerve, femoral artery, and femoral vein here. That is a cadaveric specimen showing the front of the side. At the femoral triangle contents, they are the femoral cheese which surround the femoral artery and the vein, the femoral artery and its branches, the femoral vein and its tributaries, the femoral nerve and its branches, and the deep inguinal lymph nodes. These are the contents of the femoral triangle. Again, this is a cadaveric specimen, a very good one, where the sartorius two ends are here to show the femoral artery, the femoral vein, and the femoral nerve from lateral, the most lateral is the femoral nerve, and the most medial is the femoral vein. And this is the profunda femoris artery here, the tensor fasciolata ending in the iliotibial tract, and this is the quadriceps muscle. The floor of the triangle shows here the adductor longus and the vessels in front of the pectineus. We are going to describe the layers of the abdominal cavity before we understand or describe the femoral cheese which surround the femoral vessels. In a simple diagram here showing the different layers of the anterior abdominal wall by the skin the superficial fascia, the muscle layers, and deep to the muscles in the fascia transversalis. That fascia transversalis will be continuous up to form the subdiaphragmatic fascia below the level of the diaphragm. The same fascia will continue to form the fascia of the posterior abdominal wall here, then continue to form the pelvic fascia covering the pelvic muscles, the upper surface of the pelvic muscles. So it is a continuous layer forming like a bag, which is the abdominal cavity. Deep to the fascia transversalis and the other fascia in yellow here is what to call it the extra fatty tissue. Then 
inside is the closed sac which is the peritoneal sac that is the layers here in the cross section in the anterior wall and how it continues in the other parts of the abdomen all the organs the nerves the vessels any structure in the abdomen which are mainly on the back lies between the fascia and the parietal layer or the peritoneal sac embedded in the extra peritoneal fatty tissue that is the arrangement of the structures in the abdomen that's why structures from the abdomen going to the thigh will take a layer from the fascia a tubular one going down surround those structures to the thigh and this is what will form the femoral cheese that is the layer and the structures will be over here as we said in the previous slide the structures coming from the abdominal cavity to the thigh which are the femoral vessels here extension of the external iliac artery which will form the vein and the continuation of that femoral vein will be the external iliac vein both of them are found in the greater pelvis in the abdominal cavity to pass from the abdomen to the thigh as we said there is a prolongation of the fascia from the anterior abdominal wall this is the fascia transversalis from the posterior abdominal wall the fascia covering the iliacus in the greater pelvis and this is what we call it the fascia iliaca prolongation of these two fascia will form the anterior wall and the posterior wall so the, it is a funnel shaped as we said of deep fascia prolongation from the abdomen surrounding the upper one and a half inches that is the length of the sheath of the femoral vessels the anterior wall as we said is down in prolongation of the fascia transversalis from the anterior abdominal wall while the posterior wall is the downward prolongation of the fascia iliaca covering the iliacus muscle from the posterior abdominal wall which is the greater pelvis part of the posterior abdominal wall the sheath is divided into three compartments by two septa a medial one intermediate one and lateral one the lateral contains the femoral artery and the femoral and the femoral branch of the genitofemoral nerve while the intermediate one contains the femoral vein only the most medial part is what we call it the femoral canal and it is empty and contains only some fatty tissue and one lymph node which we call it the lymph node of Cloquet the canal is half an inch in length and its upper part is what we call it the femoral ring so the median wall of the sheath is half an inch in length while the lateral wall is vertical and is one and a half inches in length that is the femoral sheath that is a sagittal section along the abdomen and the thigh passing by the femoral sheath that is the median and that is the intermediate part of the sheath where the femoral vein is passing that is the great saphenous which join it through the saphenous opening the most medial one is empty as we said that's when you got a section along the femoral artery the artery will be there along the vein as we can see here will be the vein having an anterior wall and posterior wall this is the fascia transversalis contain, continuous here to form the anterior wall and this is the fascia iliaca continuous to form the posterior wall as shown here that is the femoral canal the most medial one 
which is half an inch having a femoral ring which will be filled by the fat which you call it femoral septum that is the extension of the fascia transversalis and that is the extension of the fascia iliaca the important one is the femoral ring and this femoral ring as we'll see is covered by the femoral or closed by the femoral septum which is of some fat and the single lymph node of Coloque which we mentioned but most important is that the parietal peritoneum is covering the upper part of that septum as shown in the previous slide this is a weak point in the wall of the abdomen and could be a site of femoral hernia so it is half an inch wide that ring it can admit the tip of a little finger and it's closed by condensation of extra peritoneal fat tissue as we said and this is what call it the femoral septum the boundaries are anteriorly the inguinal ligament which is a very strong and tough ligament posteriorly in the bactinian line the bony part of the superior cremus covered by the bactinian ligament again this is a very strong boundary laterally will be the femoral vein with the septum separating it from the vein while medially will be the sharp edge of the lacunar ligament which is attached to the pubic tubercle by its apex its base the free border is the medial boundary of the ring now as we can see the ring is bounded by strong ligaments so the hernia passing through that ring is not dilatable it cannot be dilated and strangulation is very common in the femoral hernia more than an inguinal hernia as we said the ring is blocked or closed by the femoral septum from the fatty tissue and the single lymph node and the septum is covered above by the parietal peritoneum where small intestine which have a mesentery can push that parietal peritoneum and pass through the ring and the femoral hernia.